First, let me just say I'm a former U.S. park ranger. I have been assigned to various parks all throughout the USA. Back in 1991, I was assigned to the Isle Royale National Park in Lake Superior. It was my job to patrol almost 100 miles of backcountry and write reports on the conditions of several trails. I would rotate my patrol route every couple of weeks to avoid getting too familiar with the backcountry and kept myself alert. During the first part of late August, I rotated to the west end of the island, to the Greenstone area. The Greenstone is located on the northeastern part of the island. It is like a pile of massive rocks on a point overlooking Lake Greenstone Cove. The area around this point is a well-known spot for the Native Americans, for making tools and other items from the Greenstone and for fishing. The area is also reputed to be very haunted, and some of the stories are quite horrifying. This place is covered in very thick spruce forest, and there are only a couple of trails that even cut through. One of the trails is called the Greenstone Shore Trail. It cuts through the forest and is on the shore of the lake. It is a very isolated area, and the only way in or out of the area is by barge or via the Greenstone Shore Trail. So I was patrolling the southern point of the trail when I came across a clearing. I stood there and began to hear a very strange noise. The noise sounded like a long, low moan that changed to a very loud, sputtering noise. I stood there and listened for a few more moments and decided that I'd better go check it out. I walked into the clearing, scanning the area. I could see a series of old fire pits in the area, and something dark lying on the ground about 50 feet away. It was heavy, whatever this was which I initially thought was a bear, turned out to be on four legs. So I took up my binoculars and looked but couldn't really see any details on the animal. I thought it might be a bear, but its shape was beginning to look too big. I stood there for a while as it was still sputtering and moaning, and keep in mind it was kind of tucked away in tall grass. I began to believe that maybe this was a sick or injured bear or animal. So I ventured around to see if I could get a better view by getting closer to it without directly in its line of sight. When I did, the animal disappeared entirely, but the groaning sound stayed. There's no way something this large could have gotten up and disappeared from my sight that easily. Something was off, I could feel it. After it disappeared, the woods around me went completely silent, and I had this creeping feeling in my stomach that I needed to leave now and that I was in imminent danger. And then, the horrifying thought raced in my brain. What if it was a ploy? What if I was dealing with a large predator, and that was just a way to lure me into the open where I'd be more vulnerable? As these thoughts went through my head, I did not think rationally or clearly. I just got out of the area and did my best to quell my emotions. Now, two days after the incident in question, I was in the ranger station filling out reports when the dispatcher began yelling for me to come over the radio. It was a message from the Greenstone Ranger Station. There had been an accident a couple of miles north of the Greenstone Station, and they required my assistance. I got on the boat and headed over there. I met two other boats from the station, and we headed to where the accident occurred. Apparently, four people in the accident who were injured were being chased by some large black animal that they were convinced was Bigfoot. They explained that it had a large snout, huge teeth, and large claws. We took their statements. They were so scared and shaken up they had an accident by getting into their boat, smacking it into each other. Unfortunately, they're all okay with only minor injuries. But the boats, well, that's a different story. I often reflect back and wonder if there's any correlation to the large figure I saw in the tall grass there in that meadow, and what they described as seeing from the distance. I was at it was really hard to tell what exactly I was looking at. Even though it resembled a bear, I could tell it was a large animal, but because of how it was laying and how much of its body was truly concealed, there was no way to really know what it was for sure unless I got closer. But the strange groaning and moaning sounds, I'm not sure how to describe it or really write it off or rationalize it. I've heard bears make noise, even deer dying and injured, but this was different. It was so bassy in tone and the sound was different. I guess it's safe to say that I'm a little creeped out by the whole thing. And after taking these witnesses' statements, I really don't believe them to be making up stories. 
They were all visibly shaken. The one man, the bigger, older man, was actually shaking really bad, and he almost had tears in his eyes as we were all detailing the same story. Even though this was many years ago now, it sticks with me just like it happened last week. The air was crisp and laden with the aroma of dinner cooking over an open fire. My partner and I, two dedicated prospectors, had set up camp along the tranquil upper Wolf Creek. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows through the towering trees, we were lost in the camaraderie of shared stories and the promise of what the next day's prospecting might bring. But then, as if the forest itself had been jolted awake, a sudden commotion erupted from the woods. We turned our heads just in time to catch a glimpse of a bear a massive creature sprinting through the underbrush. It bounded past our campsite, its powerful form creating a blur of fur and muscle as it splashed through the creek and disappeared into the darkness on the other side. We exchanged astonished glances, our hearts racing from the unexpected encounter. Our surprise was far from over. For mere moments after the bear's passing, another thunderous sound reverberated through the air. We swiveled our heads, our eyes widening in disbelief. There, following the exact path as the bear, was an immense figure, towering and covered in hair. It was a Bigfoot, a creature often relegated to the realm of myths and legends, now running before our very eyes. The Bigfoot, every bit as swift as the bear, leaped over the creek with a grace that belied its size, disappearing into the shadows beyond. Our jaws dropped in unison, and a stunned silence settled over our camp. The forest seemed to hold its breath, as if acknowledging the rarity of the spectacle we had just witnessed. After what felt like an eternity, one of us finally managed to find his voice. What did you just see? The words hung in the air, a testament to the bewildering reality of the situation. Slowly we approached the creek, our hearts still racing, and our minds struggling to comprehend the improbable sequence of events that had unfolded before us. At the water's edge, we knelt down and examined the ground, our fingers tracing the impressions left behind by the passing creatures. There, side by side, were the tracks of both the bear and the Bigfoot. One giant print was superimposed over the outline of a bear's paw, a visual representation of the unlikely convergence of two enigmatic beings. Days later, still awestruck by our encounter, we shared our story with our fellow National Guardsmen during our monthly meeting in Grants Pass. Excitement radiated from us as we recounted the tale of the bear and the Bigfoot, the unlikely companions that had sprinted through our camp with a reckless abandon, completely unbothered by our presence. As the unit sergeant listened to our account, he could sense the sincerity in our voices and the awe that still lingered in our eyes. He had no doubt that we had experienced something truly extraordinary. It was a moment that would forever bind us, a memory etched in our minds, a testament to the mysteries that still linger within the depths of the forest, waiting to be uncovered by those fortunate enough to bear witness. I was packing supplies into a shelter on the long trail. I was 10 or 11. I got ten bucks for it each time I did it. I am coming back out and I hear a dog barking. I think, cool. Someone is hiking with their dog. Then I hear another dog bark and another and another until there were about twenty different voices, and I felt the hairs on the back of my neck go stiff. They could not have been much more than a couple hundred yards away. I knew there was no way to avoid or outrun them, so I climbed the nearest pine tree I could get to. I was up about twenty feet when this pack of wild dogs arrived and proceeded to circle the tree, occasionally following my scent up the tree trunk. Then they decided to try and wait me out. Only one person knew I was packing in, and he wasn't going to be home until 10.30 at night. So we waited. All I had was a buck knife and a wrist rocket, so I made the wait as painful as possible. When I ran out of rocks, I used pine cones small green ones. I may have peed on them a few times too. It was dark when they decided to leave. I walked home after collecting a handful of stones. Met my dad on the road going home. Never so glad to crawl into bed.
My dad was a professional land surveyor, and I would work for him on weekends or during the summer. We were doing some work in a large conservation area and had parked the truck in a wide path that was supposed to be only open to environmental police and such, but there was obviously illegal dumping. We were going back to the truck for lunch, and when we stepped out onto the path near the truck, it was surrounded by at least half a dozen bikers who had broken the driver's side window and thrown all the gear out looking for stuff to steal. We were about 50 feet from them, and it felt like hours of silence when one of them said to the others, he saw us, they can identify us. I was 11 or 12, I don't really remember, but I was old enough to know what he was insinuating. My dad stepped in front of me, made a gesture with his hand that was holding his machete a common tool for land surveyors, and said, We didn't see anything, we're just working. Now I know for a fact my dad was capable of hurting people, even his own kids, and he could scrap. After a long pause, they backed away got on their bikes and left. My dad had us pack up only the important or expensive gear stakes and property bound stayed and drove us out of there in the other direction. I've never seen him be that reckless with a truck before or after. With we got to a nearby convenience store, my body and mind completely drained of adrenaline and I lost it. I couldn't even stand. I couldn't believe those people were going to kill us just because we caught them breaking into our car but they absolutely were. My dad was a shit person. He was abusive and mentally ill. But there were a few times he showed he didn't hate me, and that was one of them. Hiking in Colorado through some old train tunnels with a friend, not far off from a fairly populated area. The train tunnels were fascinating, blasted out of mountain with some quite long, requiring headlamps but definitely wouldn't want to be there alone. We eventually dead-ended so backtracking the way we came. As we exited one tunnel, there was a severed deer head in the middle of the path that wasn't there the first time we walked through. Not a recent kill, but still fully fleshed. On our way into the area, there were some tents that were clearly used by homeless individuals maybe 150 yards off the path. We took it as a clear sign we weren't welcome and needed to leave immediately. I always try to be on high alert, but this is not only because I'm often in the woods, but then I'm also often by myself, and people are known to do some pretty dumb things out here. I want to be out here to keep them safe. For the most part, this is routine. People, though, for the most part, are generally well-behaved when they're out camping, but sometimes things can get weird. On this occasion, it started off as normal enough. I was by myself, patrolling the campsite during the night, not really expecting anything to happen. I was looking up at the sky, and I saw something that caught my attention, but whatever it was was moving along the tree line. I didn't think much of it at first. I assumed it was maybe some sort of animal or bird, but as I watched, it became clear that it wasn't an animal at all. This was some sort of hideous creature, probably not an animal I've ever seen before. It was tall and gaunt, long arms and a very thin frame. I could make out some sort of hair, but it was too dark to determine this thing's color. It had a long snout like that of a wolf or a dog, eyes that glowed dimly green. Its legs were incredibly long, and so the stride was almost comical as it walked away. I was terrified beyond belief by its sight, but I didn't want to show myself until it came closer. Even though this thing seemed to be headed towards the campsite, I couldn't leave everybody at my sight vulnerable. I waited until about 10 feet from the camp before I stood up from my hiding place, firing a shot into the air. It stopped dead in its tracks, as if it were confused as to what I was doing. I think it also realized there were humans at this campsite now, and we were all very vulnerable. It paused for a moment before it turned and ran back the way it came towards the tree line. I fired another shot, but this one missed. I was too panicked to aim properly, and I got away with whatever mischief it had in mind. I woke up the rest of the campers, told them what had happened. I only saw it for a few seconds, but it's burned into my memory like a brand. That thing, whatever I shot at, was pure evil. 
I never went out patrolling alone at night ever again after this. I'm a 16-year-old dude, and this happened a few weeks ago. I'm fairly chill and I just live with my grandfather on the east side Kentucky, barely above the Tennessee line. I'm a big guy and typically I don't do anything particularly bad. I don't smoke, I don't dip, I don't even drink. To be clear my grandfather is 76 and has just about beaten some type of leukemia. I'm a welding nerd also, it's the thing I enjoy most at school. Sometimes when I can't sleep or I wake up in the middle of the night, I put on some clothes and go outside to my shed. My shed is really a spare two-car garage with metal working equipment inside. I find the sound of the arcs pleasing to my ear while I'm tired and it can help me ease my mind as I'm a nervous person to begin with. Now, if you're not familiar with Eastern Kentucky, it's like a bowl, mountains surround you 360 and thing like coyotes and snakes are common to see rummaging about at night. They don't really scare me because the path to my shed is well lit and concrete. I have a few windows in the building, all but two are broken out from stupid shit. I did as a little kid the inside of the shop is actually brighter than my bedroom. There's plenty of light so I turned my ventilation on, set up my welder and started welding on some scrap metal to practice the 3F position. Echo vertical welding with a small process. I do this a lot and no one really minds as my ventilation system is rather quiet and you'd have the hearing of a bat to notice it in another house. I'm sat there in my metal stool and something is wrong. I'm a pretty talented welder by nature, it comes as natural to me as breathing. So when my welds looked shaky and there was spatter everywhere, I knew something was wrong. My welder was set right, so I hadn't bumped it with my knee when welding. I heard something like a cowbell. My neighbor has a cow in his yard, so I figured she got out it happens a lot. So I looked outside and didn't see her. Anywhere. This isn't a calf, this is a nearly full-grown cow that weighs upwards of 1 in 200 pounds. They don't just vanish into thin air. I checked another window and I could barely see anything. My shed may be bright, but the trees block most of that light at night. But I did see something. Now I kinda wish and hadn't seen it. It was deformed, weird and long, it had fur. So I thought I was just looking at a coyote pack, but no. This thing was too big to be a coyote or a wolf and too skinny to be a bear. Imagine a stereotypical Bigfoot and starve him that's what this looked like. Somehow it was more greasy and horrible than I first thought. I turned my welder off and then ran back into my house. I grabbed a flare gun and headed back outside. Looking back on this, I really don't know why I didn't grab my grandfather's rifle. I have a hunting permit and this thing is on my property. Somehow in my head shooting a flare at it was the best idea since inventing electricity. So I opened the window and shot a flare at the thing. I don't think I regret anything more than I regret that. It looked up and its face was horrifying like a bulldog. Its face was scrunched up and small, protruding out just enough to notice. And to make it all worse it was on a big round head. It looked at me, howled a screech and ran. I guess the flare was as scary to it as it was to me. I found out that my neighbor's cow had had the bell stolen off of it and been scratched deeply in the neck, back and the legs. I told everyone about what I saw. And what worries me now is that another neighbor of mine claims to have seen it too. It took a chicken of his. In 1947 I was heavily involved with the military and I was also a pilot. I was assigned to work with an intelligence unit located right at the Pentagon. I was only 19 at the time, just out of high school. I was very idealistic and I wanted to serve my country. I remember all the major newspapers and media outlets were talking about flying saucers. The news was all over the place about how these UFOs were appearing in the skies. Nobody was able to get them on radar though. It was simply pandemonium, as some people thought it was the Russians, some people thought it was Sputnik. The media spread all kinds of crazy theories that were way ahead of their time. Most people thought these flying saucer things were some kind of top-secret government project, but they weren't sure what the government was actually doing about it. 
It didn't help that just months later in 1948, the U.S. Smaken had crashed into the Pacific Ocean, and the story broke that the Navy had been flying around in apparently giant airships they also crashed and it was never fixed, but we managed to keep it a secret for some time. In the meantime, the Pentagon told all of us that our job was to keep watching these things. They were always appearing somewhere, the stories were all over the place, but most of them were coming out of the Southwest. I remember my commanding officer telling us that if we spot one of these things, to abandon our post, do not engage. If we were in a war zone, the order was to shoot first, ask questions later, like the recording in the transcript. It was a very stressful time. I remember your typical media outlets having a field day. Since there was no internet, you can turn on the radio. You'd hear all kinds of wild theories and explanations about what these things could have been. I was assigned to do lots of research and analysis at the Pentagon. Most of what we were doing involved watching for saucers and checking out the military's radar systems. We were told to be on the lookout for attacks from Russia or any other Soviet-affiliated countries. I didn't see a flying saucer myself until 1952. It was one of the most frightening experiences that I had during my entire tenure in the military. I was in the Air Force at the time. I had only about 23 or 24 years old. I was stationed in a small base near Area 51 in Nevada. I was still working with the same unit, but now it's much smaller. We had our own little compound on the base. That's where we constructed all of our work. The base didn't even have a name, so we called it S-4 and that's how everybody would refer to it. At the time, we only had around six or seven people, including our commanding officer. The UFOS stopped appearing after 1952 because we apparently figured out how to catch them on radar using special technology. The media had stopped talking about them for a time, but things began to heavily escalate shortly before Vietnam. Many years later, there was another incident in 1959 a military cargo plane had crashed into a remote section of the Sierra Nevadas. The wreckage was spread out across the mountains, and we had to do all kinds of intense field work to track every piece down. The Air Force informed us that these things weren't from Earth. What was on that plane we had to secure the scene as best as we could. I was only a first lieutenant at the time and didn't really know much about these things until we began receiving orders from Washington that we had to abandon any and all posts until we found out what these objects were. I was interrogating one of the survivors from the crash. He was the only one who knew anything. He told me he didn't remember much about where they came from, but it wasn't of this universe. He had a lot of injuries and he was banged up pretty badly. We were told by our commanding officer to bring him back to the base at S-4. When I got to the base, I saw that the other officers were guarding an alien body that had crashed into the ground somewhere. It looked like a huge insect, but with two arms that were attached to its torso. It had a small hidden body covered in hard chitin. It was very scary looking, but it had been dead for several hours. We didn't have to worry about it attacking us. Turns out this was a cargo plane carrying the bodies of aliens down towards Mexico. I got a chance myself to look at the body when my commanding officer told me about what the alien survivor had said. He explained that these things were very real, whatever they were, they were definitely not from Earth origin, and the government had known about these things for a long time. Even the survivor who I won't name was actually the second person on record to talk about them. It made me wonder if there was a survivor from the crash I found who's willing to spill the beans, and many of us in the military at the time referred to them by the others. They were very technologically advanced, so much so they could have wiped us off the face of this planet if they'd really wanted to. We were in a cold war with them, after all. We'd been sending in our transmissions into space for decades now. The signals we put out are very specific, and include everything from mathematical equations to images of our solar systems. We've been doing it for a long time, so essentially telling them exactly where to find us as a part of our project. In 1965, we had a horrific incident at one of our undisclosed locations underneath Chicago. We had a secret foreign technology testing facility. Several subjects had begun to mutate, 
including some of the workers that were exposed to hazardous chemicals. The strange thing about this incident is that there were no survivors. There were several bodies of military personnel that were found in the aftermath of this incident. We eventually pieced together what happened between some bodies and a few survivors, but it was too late to save them all. The ones that were mutated became stronger, faster, and much more resilient. They had increased their mass beyond what we could really understand. Thankfully, our cleanup crew was able to handle it all before things got too out of hand. I know it sounds terrifying, but our military was capable of handling them. Since the 1970s came, things changed for the worse. They were pushing for bigger, more unethical projects, intermixing human DNA, advanced bioweaponry, and all sorts of experimentation really began happening. Our military technology at the time had increased exponentially as well. We were told that we would have our own alien technology within the next few years. I had started working on these few projects, but had some moral issues with some other stuff they were doing. I heard about horrific experiments on human beings, but our superiors kept telling us it had to happen for the sake of the country. We began to notice that UFOs were being sighted more frequently right around military bases, and it got to a point where most of our technology was being crushed by superior alien forces. We had this massive accident in 1979 that took a massive toll on both our military and their technology. The incident had occurred in 1979, and it was just after the Iranian Revolution where they gained control of our embassy in capturing our people. The technology we had at the time was enough to cause some pretty bad damage, but not as much as it could have been. Of course, this was all just the beginning. They had more technology than what we were able to understand, intimidating us into surrendering whole countries to them without firing a single shot. We were literally at their mercy, not having enough firepower to really cause any damage. This, of course, all happened under the table, beyond the sight of the public eye. There are only ever a handful of people right now alive that even have knowledge of this, besides whoever decides to read this. It is the moral obligation of every single person to spread this information. The others were very much real, and this is all very true. The experiences that I've shared with you today have changed my life forever. I have so much more I can share, but I figured it's best to break these up into smaller posts. So I'm going to end this here. I'll see you in the next one. My mother and I saw a bird that followed the car up a mountain road near Maysville, West Virginia. We saw only the tail and the underside of this animal. Its wings were almost as wide as the road. This animal repeatedly flew over the hood of the car as we drove. It did not have a feathered tail. Its tail looked long and coiled up. It was dark in color. When we witnessed this, I told my mother that it looked like a prehistoric bird. This animal was much larger than a turkey, turkey buzzard, owl, eagle, hawk, or any other bird of prey that I have ever seen. It had a broad, heavy body. In fact, it looked so large that it had trouble getting airborne, and it used the path of the road to get up in the air. This bird looked large enough to easily take down a dog or deer-sized animal. I cannot say that it had any man-like features but this was something that both myself and my mother still remember. I have to believe that other people witnessed what we saw, and I can see why they called it Mothman. This is a true story for obvious reasons. I can see that people blow it off as untrue, but we know the truth. I know another person in Maysville, WV, that has described something similar. He explained to me he did not know what it was, but it was as big as the highway is wide. My home away from home is the woods. Specifically, it's the woods of Mission Tejas State Park, 21 miles northeast of Crockett, Texas. I work as a park ranger, taking church groups and school trips through the forest, showing them the woods I so dearly love. I also show them relics from the local Caddo Indians that used to live there, as well as pioneers who settled a couple of miles away at the Rice House. Back home, I have a wife who is retired, and my best friends. I love my wife and friends, but the park is like that friend you never really talk to. 
but you get to know and enjoy their company. I am at peace with the local wildlife, which I have known all my life. On breaks, I drive a couple of feet off the trail, find a stump and sit down. I am at peace in the forest. I love my job, and I make damn sure that everyone else will too. My fantastic stories of caddo hunts and local legends are loved by all. I make sure that everyone at least knows about what happened. One day, I am taking a group of school kids out on a walk. I talk about the deer, the birds, and the pines that seem to stretch up for miles. I am leading the group up a steep hill when suddenly, I become dizzy and short of breath. I think of this as merely the result of my aging body. Then, I begin feeling pressure in my chest. A small alarm is ringing in my head. But then I blame the bean-eating competition I had the night before with my wife and friends at the local Mexican restaurant. It is only when my left arm begins to feel as though a thousand volts of electricity had pumped into it that I begin to have concern. I know exactly what is happening. A heart attack. Before I can cry for help though, I collapse. I come to moments later, dazed and confused. I get up and catch movement out of the corner of my eye. The curious ex-Vietnam vet stumbles, then walks up the hill, as if nothing is wrong. At the top of the hill is a group of people dressed like the local Caddo Indians. They seem to have been led by a young woman holding a baby. They seem to be dressed right, but something just doesn't feel right. Who are you? I ask. Nothing. Can anyone answer me? No response. Well, look, it's been a nice conversation we've had here, but I need to get back. Thank you, says the woman. What? I stammer out, dumbfounded. You are the man who has told our story when no one else would. For that, we thank you. From behind the woman, a small army has amassed. Indians, settlers, ranchers, soldiers, anyone who had lived and died on the park's land. Finally regaining my composure, I reply, Well, y'all are more than welcome. Now if you excuse me, I need to do my job. The Caddo woman gives me a sad smile, saying, I'm afraid you can't do that anymore, John. You're going to be here now. Confused, I turn around. At the bottom of the hill is chaos. My crumpled body lies still in the cool, moist clay. Meanwhile, some parents are performing CPR on my vacant body, while others try to get help, and still others are trying to comfort the kids. Some of the kids are crying, while others are sitting, trying to wrap their young minds over what had just happened. Some of the bigger, more curious ones are trying to poke my body with sticks and fingers, trying to see if I would move and somehow, some way, jump back to life. Everyone has their own ideas on what to do, but panic, then desperation, then realization set in, one after the other. I am dead and nothing can be done. I watch all of this from the top of the hill, my spirit's presence unbeknownst to the others. Rangers swarm onto the scene, put a blanket over my body, place it into the back of a jeep, and drive off. Suddenly, Mexican food doesn't taste as good as I remembered it before. Hey, just before I explain the story, I want to clarify a few points. First, this occurred in the United Kingdom. I understand that this is a SW subreddit, but it really does fit the criteria and you seem like experts regarding this topic more than anyone. Second, this wasn't a dream or hallucination. Whilst on a late night walk, me and my sister heard or witnessed this. It is corroborated and on a late walk, perhaps around 10, 30, 11, me and my sister took a path through a churchyard and through some fields. Approaching an enclave in the next field, however, we heard a scream. It was not like an animal, nor human the harmony of both high and deep was rattling. Like a man screaming, crossed with a dying animal. There was a hedge in our way, obstructing vision. Whatever it was, it lay behind the hedge. We both looked forward and saw the silhouette of a tall, crooked thing. It was on two legs, though its back was hunched forward, its head long and with jagged teeth. We didn't know what it was, nor did we want to. In any case, without speaking to each other, we ran in the opposite direction. Both of us. I am a coward, but my sister is tough as nails. She wouldn't simply run from an animal's cry. 
And yet, we both ran. Any thoughts about what it was? I had a group of friends who used to get together and play manhunt in a local park at night. Just a different way of saying a big game of hide and seek tag, where three people start off it, and everyone else goes and hides in the park. As they find and tag people, they become it, as well until eventually there is only one three people left, then we start again, and play into early morning. Well one night I was it with my friend and his younger brother. We were heading to the middle of the park, to a hot spot for hiding places. There is a long stairwell that leads up a huge hill to a pavilion and field. We were slowly walking down those stairs, maybe halfway down when we noticed two folks way below us. Thinking it was one of our friends, we tell out, Hey, who's that? Instead of the normal reaction, which is to call out your name, then sprint away trying to avoid getting tagged, a strange voice responds, Who the F are you? We at first started sprinting down at them like we normally would. But then we realized they too were sprinting at us. We don't even hesitate. We turn around and sprint up the stairs as fast as we can, adrenaline kicking it hair sticking up on the back of my neck. We make it up on top of the hill and pause, when I look back and they are right behind us, not more than ten feet away, which is absurdly fast because of how much distance we had had between us. We lose our shit and start sprinting as fast as possible to the park trail, that wraps around the entire park and leads to a road where one of our friends live, and that we use as a meet-up spot between games. It's a two-mile run back from where we are so we book it, sprinting as if our lives depended on it, occasionally looking back and seeing the two people following behind. As we get nearer our energy is spent, but we push on and make it to the street, looking back and there is no sign of the two strangers. All of our group is back at the house, lounging on the driveway, having decided to prank us that night, and while we were off in the park searching for them, they would meet back at the house until we gave up. We shared our story with them and some laughed in disbelief. Others wanted to search the park for those two randoms, but we never discovered who they were. All I know is that they were incredibly fast and shady as F. When I was younger, I went to a state park with my family. There's a fairly large hiking trail up a hill that leads to a cave. Well, me being a child, I thought they were taking too long, so I took off up the trail into the woods, ended up losing the trail and screaming for help for a good 20 minutes. I fully convinced myself that I could survive for at least two days, build a shelter, and catch some food. I'm glad they found me before I set up camp. Another time I had just woken up from my first night on a camping trip and decided to walk to the lake. About five minutes into my walk, I look to my left and see five wild boars about 20 yards from me. That was possibly scarier than the first in incident. The crisp autumn air cut through the night as we sat around the campfire, the warm glow flickering against the canvas of our RV. My husband, Mike, and our 10-year-old daughter, Emma, were nestled inside, sharing stories and laughter. The remote wilderness of Kansas surrounded us, a perfect backdrop for a family camping trip. As the night deepened, a sudden crackling of branches disturbed our peaceful gathering. I exchanged glances with Mike, and a silent agreement passed between us to investigate. Grabbing a flashlight, we stepped outside into the chilly darkness. The moon cast an eerie glow over the trees, and that's when we saw them two children standing just beyond the circle of light. Their eyes reflected the beam of the flashlight, making them appear pale and otherworldly. A shiver ran down my spine as they timidly approached us. Can you help us? The smaller one asked, his voice barely more than a whisper. His companion, a slightly older girl, stood beside him, her eyes filled with an unsettling sadness. Mike and I exchanged glances, torn between a desire to help and a growing unease. Despite their eerie appearance, they seemed so innocent. With a nod, we followed the children into the woods. The night pressed in around us, and the path seemed to twist and turn, making it impossible to maintain our bearings. 
After what felt like hours, the children suddenly vanished into thin air, leaving us alone in the quiet, haunting stillness of the forest. Panic set in as we realized we were utterly lost. The trees loomed overhead like silent sentinels, and every attempt to retrace our steps only led us deeper into the labyrinth of shadows. Fear crept into our hearts, and whispers of doubt filled the air. Hours turned into a day, our journey through the woods reminiscent of a nightmare. Desperation gripped us until, like a mirage in the desert, we stumbled upon our RV. Relief washed over us as we hastily climbed inside, shutting the door behind us. Exhausted and bewildered, we left that desolate place behind, the mystery of those ghostly children lingering in our minds. As we drove away, the landscape gradually shifted from the haunted woods to the familiar sights of civilization. In the safety of daylight, doubts lingered. Were those children real, lost like us in the vast wilderness, or were they something else entirely? The uncertainty clung to us like the shadows of the night, a chilling reminder of a camping trip forever etched in our memories. One night my friend and I decided to hike to the top of this small mountain at night for a meteor shower. There were four of us, all around 16 at the time, and thought it would be cool. We drove over and started hiking. We took a break about halfway when we noticed there was a guy following us. In a business suit, we were weirded out so we decided to start back up and walk a bit faster. But by the next time we stopped he was like 10 feet away, so we bit the bullet to see if he'd just walk by. He didn't. He stopped and asked if we were there for the meteor shower and if he could walk with us. Weird a 30-something year old man in a suit wanting to hike with four 16-year-olds, but whatever. As we were walking my friend and I noticed he was walking really close to our friend the only girl in the group like he could smell her shampoo close. We got to the top, sat down, and he sat down almost right up on our friend. With her reasonably freaked out I made an excuse on why we have to leave early, and we promptly booked it the F out of there nearly running the entire way down. When we got back to the car, we thought, cool, we ditched the weirdo. But no. When we were all in the car, our my friend pointed out that this guy is full on sprinting down the trail and towards our car with a large stick. Being in a car, we just drove out of there very shook up. We chalked it up to some dude on some hell of a drug. But two days later, we all got a text linking us to a news report about a guy that had strangled his wife and then proceeded to kill another girl later that night on a hiking trail. It was the guy, the same dude at the same hiking trail. We never told our parents about the incident and never went back there, ever. I was with a fire crew checking on a water source. I stopped and sat on a rock as the crew went ahead. The area was a free-range area. The cows that were in the meadow began to bellow, and I watched them all run to the northern side of the meadow. I first thought there might be a cougar amongst the cliff area. I then scanned the ridge and noticed something standing at the edge of the cliff. I thought it might have been like a burnt tree there. Then it began to turn from side to side, and I then could see it had a head and shoulder form to it. After a few seconds, it turned and walked back towards the wooded area. I'll never forget that eerie camping trip near Fish Lake, Oregon, which took place about seven, ten years ago. It was a peculiar experience that still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. You see, my friend and I were both avid believers in the existence of Bigfoot and we decided to set up camp in the heart of the wilderness near the Pacific Crest Trail, not too far from Klamath Falls. As night fell and the forest grew darker, we huddled around our crackling campfire, sharing stories and laughs. Little did we know that our own story was about to unfold in the most unexpected way. It was well past midnight when the first bone-chilling screams shattered the tranquility of the night. Terrible, frightening screams that echoed through the trees and seemed to pierce the very fabric of reality. We froze in our places, our hearts pounding like tribal drums, our eyes locked on each other's faces, 
seeking some reassurance that what we were hearing wasn't just a figment of our imagination. The screams continued, relentless and haunting, lasting for what felt like an eternity five to ten agonizing minutes that sent chills down my spine. The night seemed to stretch on forever. The forest transformed into an otherworldly realm where fear and curiosity waged a fierce battle within us. As dawn broke, the screams finally subsided, leaving behind an eerie silence that seemed almost more unsettling. Determined to unravel the mystery, my friend and I embarked on a journey into the depths of the forest, tracing the direction from which the screams had originated. Following the trail through the underbrush, we stumbled upon indistinct tracks in the soft, damp earth. These tracks were unlike anything we'd ever seen before large and elongated, leaving a trail of intrigue in their wake. But the strangest discovery lay ahead. There, in the middle of one of the tracks, was a lifeless baby porcupine, its tiny body squashed as if by some unseen force. The sight was jarring, and a shiver ran down my spine as a thought crossed my mind. Could this be what the creature was screaming about? My friend, ever the intrepid adventurer, decided to cast one of the tracks as evidence of our encounter. As he worked meticulously, I couldn't help but glance around nervously, half expecting some hidden presence to reveal itself at any moment. With the cast in hand and a deep sense of trepidation, we began our journey back to camp, our thoughts swirling with the enigmatic events of the past night. Upon returning, we couldn't help but share our experience with Mike, a fellow believer in the mysterious and unexplained. Mike was intrigued, and he promised to try and secure a photograph of the casted track for us to share with others. Our story had taken a curious turn, as the events of that night remained etched in our memories, a haunting reminder that the wild still held secrets beyond our understanding. To this day, whenever I gaze into the depths of a forest or hear a distant howl in the night, I am transported back to that fateful camping trip near Fish Lake, Oregon. The memory of those screams and the inexplicable tracks serve as a constant reminder that there are mysteries in this world that elude explanation, waiting to be uncovered by those daring enough to venture into the unknown. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.